soon? No. Okay, good. Um, welcome to the Think the Same Research Group interim uh, meeting. Uh, we are sitting here in no longer that sunny Paris. Used to be sunny right. most of the day. Um, and uh, in the provinces of uh, India, uh, there is a hackathon going on that, that is uh, mostly oriented towards security uh, technologies. And uh, since uh, we thought uh, this place is going to be the center of the universe uh, for IoT security related things, we might uh, as well do a thing to thing research group uh, interim at the same uh, time and place. And that's uh, why we are here. So this is the Think the Thing Research Group. Uh, the chairs are Ari and me. And Ari will be a little bit on the backstage uh, today because his voice is damaged. And if you listen closely to my voice, that is already going down as well. So in about half an hour, somebody else will have to take over the meeting. I don't know. <clears throat> and um, we start every one of these meetings with a note where, just to remind people what regular attendees already know. Uh, we are in a meeting of the Internet Research Task Force, uh, which has certain things applying to it. And the short form is, you may be recorded, and I hope all of you filled out the form for that, because we are in France. Um, we are generally trying to be nice uh, to each other in these meetings. Uh, and there is some, something like professional standards and so on. But I think be nice uh, summarizes it. And uh, third thing, there are some um, IPR guidelines. These are actually not IPR guides, guidelines, but they are about patent claims. Uh, and please look at the IPR guidelines at iltf.org slash IPR. So this is my version of this. And then we have a, a version I'm supposed to <coughs> show. So we are getting, so if people can point out empty chairs to the people who are coming in. I think there's still one up in the front. So this is the official slide uh, with code of conduct and anti-embarrassment procedures. Um, yeah, you can talk to, if there is a problem, you can talk to the chairs, you can talk to India the can't join the Zoom afterward without rebooting. Hi, Michael. I think you're not- One time out of four. You're not muted. <laughs> I think we need to ask for uh, participants to put their name in the notes. That is correct. So Francesca just uh, mentioned that we should be putting our names uh, into the uh, notes. Um, not everybody has a laptop in front of them right now. So uh, let's see if we can self-organize that, but not everybody knows everybody's name here, so we probably need a little bit of uh, help uh, with that. And the remote attendees can look into the chat, which is on one of the next slides, uh, for the address of the notes. Um, okay, so this is uh, pretty much the administrivia here. Um, a quick reminder of why we are sitting here. Uh, we are not sitting here to create standards. That's what the ETF does. But we are trying to do longer term research work that uh, probably is focused on being related to, to the internet and circulation <clears throat> in the internet. So we are talking about standards, but only in a once removed uh, kind of uh, way. Um, so we are not an SEO. Um, and uh, we are not creating standards. We might be creating experimental uh, specifications, or what also sometimes happens is that uh, the work we do at some point just transitions to a working group, either an existing working group or a new uh, working group. And there is a very nice RFC 7418 that explains the IIF. Um, there are lots of links and um, there is a GitHub repository down on the table that has other links, and hope those are now correct. Do you have the web link? Well, if you are yes. in here, okay. Good. So, <laughs> we have a mailing list, d2trg at irtf.org. 
And because some of us cannot type IRTF.org because it becomes IETF.org automatically, the same thing also works with at IETF.org. Um, there is a chat, and those of you who have heard about Zulip can actually access this chat. And I would like uh, to ask people who, who know what Zulip is to, to actually do that. Um, yeah, the, the note taker link was just entered into Zulip by, by Francesca, but it's also here on the uh, slide. Uh, I don't like the naming convention of all of these things, but uh, yeah, it, it's very logical, just unusable. Um, yeah, and the first point is, is false. Uh, since we are not using the tech over the Bluetooth sheets, I'm not maintained by the tech. Okay, so this is the, the Eponist trivia. Let's quickly talk about T2TRG. Um, T2TRG was uh, created when we had done the first set of uh, uh, um, IoT-related application layer standards. We had done work on the network layer uh, before in six open and, and so on, uh, but we had uh, CoAP uh, published in 2014, and uh, we found that Protocol specification is great, but there are a lot of questions about how to actually use this. And for, for us at the time, Internet of Things meant an internet where low resource nodes can communicate among themselves and with a wider internet. So in, an, in a network that we call an IoT network, not everything is low resource, but we want to design things in such a way that low resource nodes can participate. And the reason, of course, is that um, a real IoT, IoT uh, will have hundreds of billions of nodes. And uh, we have to make sure these don't eat up all the resources of, of the planet. Uh, so we have to be able to work with very low resource uh, nodes. And within this grand field, we focus on issues that have opportunities for uh, standardization. And we do this full stack. So, uh, but maybe not radio layer, that, this is done by IEEE and, and people like that. Uh, but even the radio layer has to be controlled by, by someone. So we look at network management for that also. So this is pretty much the, the shape of- uh, Yes, the, I'm here to smoke now this morning. P2 TLG and then Michael, you are still here. <laughs> Hello, Michael, good morning. Which Michael? <laughs> the one who is not muted. No, you are also not muted. <laughs> okay, so the, the agenda for this meeting really can be uh, cut into three parts. So we have two talks that uh, really talk about infrastructure much more than individual uh, IoT nodes that we, we probably huh? have focused on uh, to a larger extent. Um, so we will talk about uh, turning the infrastructure to a data fabric, and we will uh, talk about uh, putting in AI in the right places. That's the, the green set. The red set is uh, a teaser about post-quantum cryptography. So at some point, we will have to, to deal with that. Uh, of course, people are discussing quantum safe cryptography in, in a lot of places. So we are not going to replace yeah, those places, but there may be some, some uh, implications on the IoT world that we specifically have to uh, look at. So we need to be uh, familiar with that. And the uh, uh, blue talks are about two specific applications or areas of applications. Uh, one is the distribution of software updates using the security infrastructure we now have in place. And the other one is uh, uh, actually using onion routing uh, with <coughs> core. And uh, we also uh, will discuss today what breakout meetings we want to have tomorrow morning. Uh, finally, you have, uh, those people on site will have seen that we have a lot of site meetings here and some of them are really t 2 TRG material. So uh, if you go to the page for this interim, you will find a link to the uh, parishackathon.legwg.org uh, site, and there you will find the list of site meetings. So you may be interested in joining there. 
Okay, so that brings us to uh, the agenda, and I'm 10 seconds uh, late, and hand over to Rajat. Hi, hope you can uh, see me and then uh, hear me. Yes. Okay, uh, okay. I haven't used okay. this tool before. Don't see your slides yet. Yes, I will try, but uh, I've never used this tool before, so let's see how that goes. Do you see the full screen window? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. My name is uh, Rajat. I'm based in uh, Finland. And unfortunately, Ari has lost his voice a bit, as some of you might know. So I'm presenting on his uh, behalf. Uh, we are a team of uh, six who have built um, a small prototype that, that we are making available for, for you hackers at the, at the hackathon. And so the title is uh, about uh, secure in-network data processing and, and, and uh, about the data fabric specifically for IoT applications. So, so what is data fabric and why data fabric? So um, as we all know, IoT is actually about making actionable insights from, from the data that all these IoT sensors are then uh, sending. But uh, based on many analyst reports, as well as our own findings, what we realize is that uh, developers spend actually a lot of time in this integration related work and not in actually deriving uh, value from, from, from the IoT data itself. And when I say integration, I mean, okay, you need to get access to the data, then you need to do all the necessary plumbing to, to actually connect those data sources to where you need them. Then you need to clean your data. Then you also need to, for example, complement that data with metadata, et cetera. So, so a lot of time is spent in setting up this infrastructure rather than actually trying to derive uh, value. So with uh, Data Fabric, then our goal is that uh, we try to enable applications and application developers to have uh, data at the right time, uh, the right data at the right time and in the right format delivered to them securely in a, and in a cost efficient manner. So that's our ambition with, with the data fabric. And uh, we hope to take advantage of the 6G uh, paradigm where uh, both the network and compute are co-located within the network. And, and so we think that the data fabric is essentially a fundamental component of this uh, 6G network. Um, to, to reason a bit more uh, about this, uh, what you can see is that uh, you have a, a box for the data fabric which is then running on the on the 6G uh, compute network and, and the 6G network. And then um, it interfaces with two systems. Uh, one is your device management systems, which, for example, knows about all the devices and their capabilities. And then other enterprise IT OT systems, for example, your ERPs and your, your SAPs. Uh, and then it interfaces with them and extracts all the relevant uh, information, say credentials or, or, for example, identities of devices or then your business process related information. And then it can then supply these capabilities. So combine all this information in, in, and then provide capabilities towards XR applications, IoT applications or other applications such as digital twins or just uh, AI ML analytics. Uh, looking a bit deeper then into how we reason about the data fabric. So we've defined, uh, let's say, two entities. In, in, in One is the data producer, which is then sending data to the fabric. And then you have consumers who are then interested in some of the data that is hosted on the data fabric. Uh, you, then the data fabric itself can be simply reasoned that it's some kind of a brokering infrastructure that allows you to connect these producers and consumers. Uh, and then instead of actually binding of location of the data to you know to some kind of a url you, you kind of get this independence that that you, the consumer doesn't need to know exactly where the data is and that is enabled through something called a service broker that does the linking of the producer and the consumer through some kind of semantics and, and ontologies uh, and and in addition to this um, mapping what we also have is a in network uh, processing capability so effectively doing on path processing and not really processing for from for data at rest uh, and the service broker can then instantiate these data processing or these data handlers at the right place at the right time based on what what uh, requirements the different applications have uh, in order to achieve this system we've designed uh, different apis so from a producer side, of course, you need to register yourself, make yourself known what, what, you're, what you're providing, and, and then, then you instantiate your services. 
and then on the consumer side you need to be able to discover what api what what, what data is there on on this infrastructure uh, and then also then uh, access those uh, access the data via those apis and then we also provide some kind of observability related information both for the for the people hosting this infrastructure but then also on the producers and the consumers for for knowing what is happening with with the data uh, we've used uh, several IETF uh, standards actually at, at work, but I'm mentioning uh, these three specific standards because some of them are being actively worked on in IETF, but then also in, in the Think to Think research group. Uh, so one of them is uh, SDF. So this allows you to describe the, basically the semantics for the, for the data. Uh, we have a registration API that allows you to upload any existing SDF documents that you have, and, and uh, you can do that in your own namespace, or then you have a global namespace. And then as a consumer, then you, you have a discovery API that you can find, okay, which are the descriptors, the data descriptors that are available on the platform. Uh, as, as I mentioned, the data fabric has a brokering infrastructure. So for this particular hackathon, then we've chosen a co-op uh, PubSub broker. So it's in a, it's in a draft and that gives us a bit of uh, validation on, on what are the shortcomings or what are the merits of this, uh, of this design. And then we've used CNML, which is a, a comp, which is a standard for a data exchange. Uh, so, so we've used that as the kind of uniform uh, API between the consumers and the and the producers, and also internally for for enabling this processing for by by the data handlers. Uh, regarding the processing of data, then. Um, what we have is an uh, API that, of course, you can you can get all the data without doing processing. But then that's rarely very useful. So, so at the moment, we've implemented some very simple data handlers just as proof of concepts. Uh, one of them is, for example, that only forward data values, say temperature values, which are greater than 20. Uh, so that's you can think of that as a filtering operation. And then other than that, we have also some kind of aggregation operation, specifically, let's say, maximum values or minimum values over some kind of uh, time periods. So for example, send me a max temperature value every 30 seconds. Um, what we have not implemented, but we plan to do soon is also then enable data format uh, transformations, because as you know, in, in the IoT world, there are so many different uh, formats. So, so then again, instead of doing this at the application level, if you try to normalize this data formats as early in your pipeline, then you get kind of benefits to do more uh, stream processing as opposed to more uh, batch processing. Uh, then the technologies for the data handlers, uh, we, we have chosen to, to currently implement uh, some of this with the WebAssembly. Uh, the rationale for that is that it is uh, lightweight and, and that it also has uh, some, some strong uh, isolation features. Uh, but of course, WebAssembly itself is in uh, early stages. So, well, when I say WebAssembly, actually, I mean the WebAssembly system uh, interface. So it's in early stages, but, but it sounds like a very promising uh, direction. Uh, the second thing is that, uh, for example, Co-op has conditional notifications. So if uh, the, the fabric is aware of such kind of application requirements, uh, we could also run these data handlers directly on the devices uh, themselves. Uh, then we, all, all of this is still uh, user space, right? So, so what we want to, to also investigate is then uh, how we could do uh, such operations instead of doing it in the user space, how could we do it in the kernel space and thereby get better performance from, from the underlying uh, system. So this is a bit about uh, processing. Um, then actually coming to the interesting uh, topic about the, the hackathon uh, itself. So uh, for the moment in our, in our uh, proof of concept, we haven't implemented uh, that much security. So we have link security, but but other than that, we, we know we can implement, let's say, um, authentication and authorization. But then the question we pose to, to you as the audience is that now you have an infrastructure that is distributed, plus there is no, no really end-to-end -end channel because or end-to-end or -end link because you have something in the middle. So how can we achieve as good security or even better security than is possible with, with let's say, end-to-end -end channel security? Uh, some ideas that we have is that, of course, you would perform this kind of data processing in some kind of uh, trusted execution environments, for example, so any kind of trusted environment. Uh, then we, as I mentioned earlier, with WebAssembly, we are investigating uh, what what kind of isolation guarantees we can get. Uh, there are other state-of-the-art methods, for example, uh, object security. Uh, then you would, in addition, of course, if you're using uh, different nodes and, and and you have distributed infrastructure, then technologies for for remote attestation come into play. Then then you know that you're you're talking to reliable uh, nodes and and that it's somewhat uh, trustworthy. 
Uh, and then another key aspect is that, okay, you have all these uh, security features, you know, and, 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 but, but how can you make them usable security? So, so that's kind of the thought process that we have with the data fabric that let's take security and make it usable. Some ideas, very simple ones is that, okay, that, that uh, you provide a bit more fine grained access control of the data. So for example, uh, being able to say, uh, which uh, the producer could, for example, say which uh, con consumers are able to access uh, what kind of data. Uh, then uh, you have uh, observability, so you know who is accessing what. <coughs> then also provenance, so that you know that these data is coming from uh, trustworthy sources. Uh, but I must admit that we are in early stages of uh, analyzing uh, what kind of provenance capabilities we have. Uh, so, so the question that we pose to you is then uh, what tools do we already have and, and how should we effectively use them in order to solve the security mm -hmm. challenges for uh, data fabric? Uh, the last thing I'd like to mention is uh, that we are also carrying forward this uh, work related to data fabric in an EU project called uh, Elastic. Uh, this is part of the uh, 6G SNS uh, call to. Um, and, and Elastic itself uh, aims to enhance this sort of efficiency and the security of uh, orchestration of services in highly heterogeneous uh, environments. Uh, and so in, in that sense, the data fabric is one of the demonstration use cases uh, in the Elastic project. So we also hope to exploit some of the results from Elastic and use them in, in the data fabric related work. So that's all I had and uh, thank you for listening. I will I will stop sharing now. So if there are any uh, thoughts or or comments, uh, we can take them now. Okay, thank you, Rajat. Uh, we have uh, approximately five minutes uh, for questions. I've got one um, in WebEx when you're ready. So I, I just uh, wanted to Sama. Uh, thank you, Elliot. Okay, so. I was wondering if you are, so in the slide, uh, you already showed about security that you have the, some plans to move to TEs. And I was wondering if you already have a plan for which TE you will use. And um, related to that, you also mentioned remote attestation. So I'm wondering if you already have some plans or have you already configured something? Um, we do have uh, some plans, but I'm not the subject matter expert on the, on that particular topic. So, so if I could uh, request you to to send me an email on the topic, and then I could uh, connect you with with, with the relevant uh, experts working on on the security domain. Uh, but from what I understand, uh, is that uh, I think the 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 step one is to kind of uh, think about this uh, Azure uh, confidential computing, what features they have. Then we also have the uh, Intel SDX capabilities to to investigate, uh, and 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 then. Um, Sorry, I think I forget what was your second question. So this is the related to infrastructure. Second was, yeah. was about remote attestation. You also mentioned. Uh, yeah, so, so there we have, uh, of course, uh, in ITF, we have uh, RATS, right? So, so that's like this uh, generic kind of remote attestation over various different platforms. But then we are developing our own tools to kind of have this unified API uh, agnostic of the underlying uh, infrastructure. So there's some work on that that we are investigating as well. So what RATS provides you is basically an architecture. It's not a complete solution, so to say. So yeah, you, yeah, I understand. And we're building our own kind of uh, investigation on on that topic. So, like I said, I don't know these details very well because I don't work on the security domain itself. Do you, but but please do send me an email if you're or interested in in collaborating on this topic. Oh, thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Elliot. Thanks, Karsten. Thanks, Rajat. First, Rajat, I just want to let you know in case it hasn't, um, in case you can't tell, your dog, your puppy has stolen the show uh, behind you. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, I know. I've been trying to. <laughs> um, my question, yeah, he's a good looking pup. Um, my question for you is how central is 6G to all of this? Or is this the proper abstraction layer for, is 6G a proper abstraction layer to be working on? Like, how does this how does this look in say a local area network or um, you know in a, in a BLE environment or uh, those sorts of things? Thanks. Um, 
I think that's a that's a great question, and I think there are uh, multifold answers to that uh, question. So, so first, if I take a five G, six G perspective, um, of course, we, we we look into you know private networks and 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 uh, you know like local deployments for for enterprises and such. And then, at least from a from a from a let's say enterprise portfolio, you always have these sort of uh, nodes that you can do let's say wi-fi or bluetooth on the on the front and then use uh, 5g or something else on the back hall so that's kind of the environment where where we are placed and and how we are uh, investigating it but if i take a little bit more abstract approach to this in in theory this is a application that is running on underlying infrastructure so as long as that underlying infrastructure provides the necessary capabilities that are needed by the data fabric uh, we can run it anywhere However, uh, what we think is that networks are becoming, uh, especially cellular and wireless networks are becoming more and more programmable as we go ahead. So what we think is that we will try to do a deep integration with some of these programmability features for 5G and 6G. So for example, dynamic uh, QoS and authentication features and things like that. So we think that of course you can run it on generic infrastructure, but we will provide you an edge that when you when when if you run it on on a 5G or a 6G. So 5G or 6G will do better than generic infrastructure. So that's kind of how we reason about it. But as you know, 6G is also in early stages. So so we've set a vision and a direction. So so we'll see where it where it takes us. Okay. Hey, th thanks for that answer. And um, I just say that as you're developing the work, um, to maybe define it define things at the abstract level in terms of the, the attributes needed at the different layers and and let let the layers sort themselves uh, to offer those services. And I think you'll have something that is far more generalizable. Yeah, thank, thank you for that feedback. Thanks. Hey, any quick question? We're almost out of time for questions. Is that it? No. Yeah, thanks a lot for the presentation. I had uh, just a quick question about like your use of eBPF. Like, um, so I don't know how much time we have, but like, uh, if we have a thirty seconds, I, I just like would like to know like how how does it fit in the picture exactly? How do you? That, that was um, interesting to me. So, uh, so as I mentioned, we are investigating eBPF. So we've gotten gotten a bit far with WebAssembly, but not so much with eBPF. But but our thinking is that uh, simple. Like, like, let's say if you have a, a CBOR parser that is written directly in eBPF, right? So, so you can basically start to do filtering and 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 such and and duplication of packets to to different nodes already at the at the kernel layer. So you don't have to pass stuff up to the the stack. So, so fundamentally, we are assuming that given a set of uh, uh, parsers existing in as eBPF programs, we'll be able to exploit some of those features. And then of course, we're not talking about eBPF standalone, we're talking about eBPF plus XDP in, in practice then. Uh, again, that's that's the level of detail that I can actually share at the moment regarding that particular track of work that we have. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So I wanted to, uh, I would like to your next. So <clears throat> for the next presenters, uh, maybe you can initiate the excruciating WebEx uh, sharing process at the end of the... I think it's 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 Thank you. Is it supposed to be shared on that screen either? Or is it fine? It's fine. It's okay. how it's supposed to be. Okay, cool. Right. Hi, everyone. Uh, my talk is going to be very close to what the previous talk was just presented in terms of the key goal, high level goals, like making data available wherever it is needed and the computing resources wherever it's needed. So let me introduce myself. My name is Abhishek. Uh, I'm from the University of Tolu. I work in 6 flagship program at the university. And uh, this is my first time to ITF event. All right, let's get dig into the presentation. So, right. So as per the motivation of previous talk, as well, it was mentioned that the future generation 5, 5G and beyond the 6G, they're expecting to be AI native. Already 3GPP is working on new release where AI will have substantial role. So that means there's gonna be a lot of data movements. And as we are in the hackathon, quite 
focusing on security. So data privacy is really the key thing. We are also focusing here. Uh, on the side, when a lot of data, they are moving, there's also sustainability because whenever data moves, there's a bits and bytes and there's associated carbon cost. It depends on where the energy is coming from. The, the, the grid is backed by the sort of a, uh, non-renewable energy source. So there's also sustainability cost. Now, we are, we are also in the age of love language models. So we all know that chat GPT-4, it costed OpenAI 100 million plus only for training. We don't know uh, for GPT-4.0, which was released just the last week, what was the cost? And other thing is that a lot of industry, especially smart manufacturing industry, uh, they're adopting uh, digital twin technology, industry metaverse technology. So, and there we need real time operations. So the basic data type we have, when you look at metaverse, it's a volumetric video. If you compare with the traditional 2D video, HD qualities, the bandwidth requirement almost five times. So the amount of data which needs to be transported across the network just use. Uh, and we want real time of guarantee. So AI nativeness is uh, likely to be the one option. So, okay, so we, since we established that uh, AI native is the important part in ICT, uh, also in telco, and also this paper, which was just released uh, a few months ago, it gives a really detailed analysis of how AI could be embedded in the telco infrastructure. So we see it's an archive, uh, with Sasu Darkoma, who is my supervisor, and with our colleagues. <clears throat> so the key question <clears throat> is, uh, uh, we know that uh, this metaverse thing, there's a huge uh, demand for high bandwidth data transportation, given the future application. Could we build sort of high performance interconnect for the continuum of entities? So we are not going to have only cloud, we will have low end embedded devices, sort of a spectrum of devices. So for the continuous of entities, which tackles these four problems, interoperability problems, uh, manufacturing industry has a major problem of interoperability and they're connecting the supply chain. So each vendor in the same chain, they have a different data standard. Heterogeneity problems, obviously data privacy problems because data needs to be transported. And of course, uh, the bandwidth problem, which is efficiency problems. So we have to, we are changing this golden question. How do we proceed with that? So, <coughs> so uh, the idea is that we could uh, go to publish subscribe based approach. It's event-based, so instead of request and reply. So this is the traditional publish subscribe based interconnect, which we all know ITF is has done quite a bit of work already. So that's one traditional approach. We can use it, but uh, there are a lot of limitations here. So one of the things was mentioned was the continuum of entities. So some entities could be really low in embedded devices. So imagine that uh, there is a big model and uh, which you need, and the node needs to do certain inference to use that particular service. But even if the model is optimized, they may not have enough memory just to do the inference. I'm not even talking about the training. Training requires substantial more resources. So this does not work in that sense. So we need some sort of cooperative frameworks uh, in the infrastructure. So infrastructure is aware that okay, inference needs to be done at the device node which has low computing. How do we manage resources in a way that it will still allow that device to get the result, inference result. So, but we can build on top of that. So, so this is, uh, we call it neural publish subscribe. I also just wanted to mention that this is a three year business Finland funded research project at the University of Oulu and the University of Helsinki, which is being done. So, so what we have in our new paradigm, so we, consider four major roles. So we have publishers, which, uh, which generates data. Uh, and then the most crucial part is the broker, neural publish subscribe broker. It tracks AI models scattered across the network. 
You could have large language models at some nodes somewhere in the network. You could have small language models somewhere somewhere in the network. So huge amount of AI models as a part of infrastructure. But this broker is responsible for ensuring that when those right models are needed, how to fetch from the network for the given use case. It has some additional capabilities like a filter and transform transformation to design pattern. I'm gonna talk in the next slide. And then it has a one element AI model splitter and reasoner. So the job is how to, in the dynamic runtime, establish inference pipeline end to end given the use case. Then we have subscriber. So subscriber is uh, it's very typical coming from the traditional, they are the con consumer. So, and one key element is uh, the execution units. Execution units is just the computational resources. Uh, and ideally by the design, it's best to co-locate with the subscriber. So, so that the, the latency is somewhat quite minimal. So, so the key idea is here, the idea is the whole entire AI processes, it needs to decompose into smaller, smaller units. And each unit should be able to run independently and parallel. And also each unit should run where the data are located. So we are not transporting the data. So wherever data is, what we do is we come with the right model, which is gonna work. Then we split into small, small parts, and then we send it where the data is located. So data is not moving, only the models is moving, and only the model embeddings and the inference results is moving. So that's how we tackle the use bandwidth problem. So there are two key design patterns which are really important. So one is, we call it uh, transform pattern. So what it does, it takes any publication, any result. Uh, it could be anything. It could be just raw data or it could be embeddings. And it applies a function which is specified. Uh, and so there are two reasons why you want to do that. Sometimes uh, the publisher, which could be end users, it has a privacy concern. So they, did, they may not want to. So they would like to apply some kind of difference of privacy. So the data has some added noise, so more protected. Now that can move across. So that is one reason. Other thing it offers is that it could be also pre-processed. So that is one. Then there's another pattern, funnel pattern. It allows uh, multiple publication to map into one. So it reduces the bandwidth overall requirement. Now these two design pattern also allows uh, handling the privacy reason. So for example, the models has been split into multiple atomic units and the first unit like M, as you can see on the left side M1 and the last unit MK1, they are done at the source, but in between they could be done anywhere. So you don't share everything. So there, so the privacy is there from that perspective. So the capability, I just want to mention very quickly, so it allows sort of resource management instead of data movement, it ensures that the model has been split into multiple smaller and they have been transported across. So, and the latency bandwidth comes from the fact that data, they are not moving anymore. Only the model and embeddings are moving. Another key challenge in the computing continuum is that uh, uh, the phenomena of forgetting, catastrophic forgetting, concept drift. So it can also tackle that one. Data privacy is not really the main concern, but it comes from by design itself, because data stays locally with the owner itself. And the, uh, the two patterns allows everything to in the distributed fashion, hence the distributed. The robustness fault tolerance also comes from the fact by the design itself that the model has been split into smaller unit and they are running independently at each node where the data is. Even if the data is corrupted, it does not really affect the entire aggregation process. And it allows heterogeneity also in case the data is in different format. 
So it can use uh, LLM brokers to dynamically map it. So uh, it's still ongoing process. We cannot we cannot claim that heterogeneity has been solved. So, so right now we have this <laughs> testbed which we have deployed across two university uh, in the south in Helsinki and in the north at Oulu to our 5G testnet. And uh, we are working on this. By summer, we expect to have working demonstration. We have, we have already given one demo to the steering committee, but to the open community, the demo should be out in the summer. So, and the use case, what we have is, uh, we know that the cellular network, we have this control plan and management plan. And as 5G and 6G, we go to next generation, we have a huge amount of nodes. So a lot of management plan, uh, data related management just keep getting increased and increased. So there is a need to manage the complexity of that. So there's an idea that we could use AI processes here. So at the very source, we send the AI process there to do the processing. Only the pre-process -pro results are sent across. The amount of data which management plan needs to deal with is substantially reduced. So that is one good use case for the telco. And we have done one work, our group, the quality of monitoring for cellular network is collaboration with Nokia Bell Labs and it's published in, in, in open channel. And similarly in ORAN case as well, or in ORAN we have X app and R apps, which directly here we are putting intelligence right at the edge of the, the network. So there's a huge use case of a new republic subscribe right here in open RAM as well. So those are the two of our main use case. Yeah, so just the conclusion. So it's a new paradigm, it's an extension of public subscribe, but more focused on sort of AI being the nativeness and mapping and funnel allows uh, more flexible deployment. Uh, also, of course, the bandwidth with that. Major goal is that we want to have process, promote massive data processing, but locally. So you don't want data to move. So, so that's how we get the data privacy, fault tolerance, of course, the sustainability. Yeah, that was my last slide, and a very brief. Thank you. So we have about uh, three and a half minutes time for questions. Uh, quick, also quickly, the paper is already out. There you could see in the detail oh. what this is all about, so. Questions? Maybe a small question. What about uh, I'm, I'm uh, explain Avelia because I'm uh, me personally. I'm worried all this uh, trend on we have black boxes, these IE models, and we need uh, explain Avelia. Do you ca can be taken in account here to generate evidence on whatever the model decides to do? This is a super generic question. So yeah, can... that is a really Good question. So uh, we haven't been really focusing on the explainability as the key focus. We have been only focusing on those models, which can we split into small, small layers. But that's a really good question. They want those black box models as part of infrastructure. Maybe the model will be flexible to, I don't know, add layers that can manage the explainability of so the answer, I don't know. The models which we have worked with because we were able to split into smaller, smaller unit and you could, those are explainable. But of course, if you want to deploy advanced model, which we can explain, uh, we cannot decompose. So that okay. would be tricky that we have considered here. Thank you. Yes, please. Uh, what about discoverability here when you have all this flexibility and you can get whatever you want? How do you know where to find it? Yeah, so for that, we consider that uh, we have this neural pop sub broker yeah. that knows what kind of models are scattered across the infrastructure. So we assume that we know from there actually. So Did you consider any security uh, aspects or problems that may occur? Yeah, so security is not really the direct focus of this project. So 
the whole this has been more like uh, we assume that okay, your own personal network uh, that's secure. So what we are making sure that the data will never leave your own personal network. So only the model embeddings will. If somehow you can reverse embeddings to raw data, and that could be a bit of security implication, but you could also solve it um, by adding some differential privacy noise. So train your model locally that you extract embeddings, and you add some differential noise, then you send it. So if someone in cap captures it, so well, you have there, some level of control. Well, there may be many different aspects of security, like also model theft and so on. So I think it's uh, probably a big uh, topic. Yeah, definitely. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So the next one on the list is Renzo. Yes. We're already seeing people leaving for this uh, talk, so I thank you, Renzo, for taking this somewhat uh, um, difficult to run, to run subject. What? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> And especially in 17 minutes or less, I, I wanted to discuss uh, with the room, so I even tried to keep it shorter. Okay, we can officially start. Um, I'm Renzo Navas, Associate Professor in Pietro Antiqui in, in Ren. Uh, now I'm mostly doing teaching and research, but it's a pleasure to be here again with all of you. So today I'm going to introduce, uh, it's, it's an overview of what is post-quantum cryptography, what's the current state of the art in the standardization bodies, particularly NIST, and also at the ETF. And yeah, maybe raise some question of, uh, okay, what can we do? How will it impact? Uh, uh, and so on. And um, some of my slides, um, uh, sorry. Some of the slides are charged, but I made them on purpose. So you can look them offline and go to the links to the sources, okay? Uh, but the outline will be as, as this, a uh, quick background on post-quantum crypto. Then I will focus on key encapsulation methods, then very briefly digital signatures, and then the more interesting part maybe to raise question, uh, okay, uh, what's happening at the ETF uh, and what are the next steps maybe for the IoT community at the ETF? So the quantum threat. Um, to the right is an actual quantum computer. I think it's the one from uh, IBM or I don't know. Well, the, the story can go as this. There is a non-zero probability that, uh, that a, a large scale quantum computer can exist in the following 50 years. We are not sure, they, they run uh, estimations, but uh, better be prepared. And in general, we use the Pascal wager uh, as an example, Pascal was a French philosopher and mathematician, and he say, according to the um, according to God, uh, he say, I cannot say if God exists, but I can live my life as if it exists. Why? It's the good thing to do because if when I die God exists, the reward is infinite. I will go to paradise. <laughs> but if I if it doesn't exist, I incur in. Uh, and little losses, maybe I, I went to church on the Sunday, but the losses are limited. So it's an asymmetric gain versus cost. So in, <laughs> in this case, the God is the quantum computer. We can say the same. Maybe it exists, maybe it done. We can be prepared or not. If we are prepared and exist, uh, good. Uh, the gains are almost infinite. The society don't collapse. And if in the end it doesn't exist, okay, the cost is, will be overhead we will have by using... Uh, Algorithms that you will see are much more bigger in terms of computation and, and communication. Sorry, I said I want to keep it short. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to move faster now. So what can a quantum computer do? Actually, not much, but he, he's very good at some things. And the short algorithm in particular uh, can solve the discrete logarithm and the factorization problem in polynomial time. In other words, very efficiently. This breaks. Uh, basically, all current as he used asymmetric cryptography, uh, Diffie Hellman, DSI, RSI, all are based on one of these two problems. Uh, this I will go quick, but another important algorithm is Grover's. He can, uh, you need an even larger quantum computer, he can solve the exhaustive search problem in square root time. 
this can break uh, almost everything, but it's square root time. So basically, this means a, a symmetric algorithm, uh, a symmetric uh, algorithm of uh, with a key of 128 bits. Square root of 128 is it's equivalent to 64 bits of strength, but it's still it's still uh, uh, still affected, but not so much. So what can we do uh, to to mitigate the quantum menace? Okay, this is the topic of quantum safe cryptography. As we say, for symmetric crypto, it's only affected by the second algorithm. So the, the, if you want to be resilient, you simply use longer keys. Assuming the quantum crypto will do square root. For asymmetric crypto, the solution is uh, abandon the discrete logarithms and factorizations, uh, um, mathematical problems, and use asymmetric algorithms that rely on other mathematical problems that so far we, we believe the quantum computer and classical computers cannot uh, solve. There is currently three main families of this uh, problem, lattice, lattices, codes, and hash base. Some of them, codes are from the 70s, lattices are from the 90s, but uh, okay. You want comments now or later? Uh, maybe later, because I'm not sure if I'm going to keep it on time, but I really want now. Uh, I, no, but I, I, I'm going to keep it. Uh, I'm not sure if I can keep it to, okay. <laughs> Uh, but we have the rest of the evening then. Just go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Post quantum crypto stands from protocol algorithms and mathematical problems that are hard to solve even for a quantum computer. Can run on current hardware, okay? Uh, so this is post quantum crypto. Of course, we said that we have also proper quantum cryptography that relies on quantum physics. And you, we can do cryptography on the, with quantum physics. And in particular, the quantum key distribution is quite... Uh, uh, develop. I will not talk about proper quantum crypto, only post quantum. So NIST, uh, the standardization progress to facilitate the the the, pass, the the passage to post quantum crypto started in 2016. This is an important slide. These are the four uh, things that are currently standardized or very soon going to be. Uh, we have three digital signatures. It's DS. And only one key, encapsula uh, key establishing algorithm is a key encapsulation method. Um, what else? For digital signatures, they are uh, currently doing a new round with 40 candidates uh, because they want more. You see, we have currently mostly our lattice base and only digital signatures hash base. We want more, more uh, solutions from other mathematical problems. In case as one of the families is broken, we still have others. Um, so this is the link for the, this summer, these are already out for comments, the comments close. This summer, this will be standardized. Falcon will take one or two more years. Let's move on. So now for key encapsulation methods. Uh, so as I say, there is only one that's been standardized. It's called, well, I call it Kyber, it was called Kyber. Now it's called the model lattice based key encapsulation mechanism. And there is other three that in a round phone that with high probability will be also standardized or at least two of them. Um, what is a KEM, K encapsulation method? It's a, a three tuple of algorithms. We have one algorithm that is called K generation, takes no inputs, gives, and encapsulates encapsulate in key at the encapsulation key. You can think of a, a secret key and public key. Then you have another algorithm that's called encapsulate, in which as input you give the encapsulation key. And as an output, it gives a, a secret, a key, symmetric key and a child vertex. And it's non-deterministic, meaning if you put two, two times the same thing, can give uh, different things. So internally, it has some entropy. And then you have the decapsulate in which you take the, the child vertex, the decapsulate key, and you will obtain the, the key. Um, this I will go fast, but this will be, this uh, shocked me when I see it. I, I was used to Diffie Hellman, mm -hmm. and this is not the same. You will have, of course, two entities, Alice will do this uh, key generation. We have the private public. Over the network, he will send what we say we can call also the public key. Bob, with this public key, uh, we say it's actually the only input to encapsulation. But internally, of course, it generates some randomness that will be the shared secret. So the key is fully, the symmetric key is fully generated by Bob. And then you send the output was a ciphertext, which Alice can. Uh, the capsulate is like using the private key to obtain the shortcut. The math behind this for, for cyber in the appendix, you have some pointers, some easy to understand, but it's 
these polynomials, there is uh, a lot of multiplications, uh, modulos. There is the number theoretic transform that allows to do multiplication easily. But the math uh, behind, but in this talk, I will focus on the network part, on the message we will have to send over the network. So this is the communication cost of the, these four camps. Um, so I will analyze only the two messages that we go over the air or over the wire uh, or over whatever. Um, we have the public key that has to go from A to B and the chi part test that has to be from B to, <laughs> to A. Uh, bad news, uh, we measure in bytes and not in bits in, in post-quantum crypto. All are in the order of bytes. And then NIST define uh, actually five categories. Here I only need three. Category one is the weakest uh, to five the most. One, two, one three, five. Uh, they, they equivalent to, to the strength needed to break a block cheaper with 128, oh, sorry, uh, 182 or 256. And um, assuming the quantum computer has limited the uh, quantum gates, you need to do it, but we can, it's equivalent to us of today, uh, the strength of 128. So this is the only standard uh, chem. Uh, here we have the families. You see, we will have the three main families. This is the public key, and this is the uh, the Chiper text. Uh, Kyber is the most, uh, let's say, uh, homogeneous. It's not so bad, 800 bytes <laughs> for a public key and for a Chiper text. As we see, bike uh, is the double. Michaelis is code base is, uh, well, it's, it's always a trade-off, right? The, the Chiper text is quite uh, small, but the, the, the Kubulukris are huge. Uh, it's a kilo. And okay, let's move on. And if you want to see some details on computation cost, okay, I, you have some links. And for digital signatures, we have we have three that will be standardized. I don't touch the other 40 that will go in several rounds and in the end we will have some more. In particular, they want non-lattice base and they say if we accept lattice, it has to be much shorter than the ones we have or, or anyway. So this is a signature, um, this is more classical. We have a key generation mechanism, then to, we have a message we send with the signature, key, the, the secret key, and then we can verify a message uh, with a signature and a public key, and if the signature is valid, we have a, a given output. So now it's the same, we have, I will analyze the public key uh, that you will have to send, and the signature in itself, and then I have to introduce the category two that is uh, is between one and three, but the category two of NIST uh, strength is defined as the equivalent to the collision search strength of a 256-bit hash function for instance SHA-266. Uh, so we have deletion, Falcon Sphinx Plus, um, and here it's more difficult to, to give a, a thing. I assume that for IoT, CAT1 and CAT2 is enough, but that, of course, will depend on the use case. And currently, um, okay, uh, maybe this we can discuss later. These bytes, I got it from the standards because uh, so these are up to date until uh, this month. Um, what I don't go into details, but uh, Falcon, uh, in theory, will say is, is much better than Dilithium. But Falcon use a lot of computational power. Uh, power. It depends on floating point operations, while Dilithium is all uh, integer. So for IoT, uh, maybe it's better. Okay, and Sphinx, the trade-off, okay, is, is quite huge. But okay, these are the numbers you can see. Uh, but well, the takeaway for me is that post-quantum crypto, we are in the order on 800 bytes. So that's the, we will have to deal with that kind of sizes. Uh, yeah, next steps, um, state of the art next steps. So we have a working group on the IETF that's called post-quantum use in protocols, Quick. Um, it's actually a venue to, um, to discuss about PQC. It tries to aggregate everything that's doing a, a, in all the other working groups and research group. He tries to, they try to aggregate things. It's very good because when I started researching uh, some months ago, this working group helped me a lot. But they plan on not doing a standardization. They say maybe informational stuff, but they will not standardize any protocol. Um, and here they aggregate all the drafts uh, which are related to post-quantum. Currently there is 68, well, many expired. 
Another thing I noticed in when I was in IETF uh, in in um, in Prague, in the other working groups, no NOT or that take post quantum, they are all about hybridization. Hybridization is a first step, according to NIST. Well, today we have known post quantum. Hybridization is when you mix quantum, uh, post quantum and classical, and you you still have the guarantees of both, so uh, you are prepared for both. Of course, you have more overhead. And then when we assume uh, the, the post quantums are mathematically strong, we transition to fully post quantum because there is no need to vote if, if you already uh, believe that the post quantums are mathematically strong. And all it's about hybridation. You can hybridate K, K establishing method or um, digital signature. Mostly the work is on a public key encryption. We have a standard how to do hybridation. TLS is working also uh, already on that, and IQV2 uh, has already RFC. Uh, but all are doing hybridization to do the, the handshake and the key, the, the key establishment. Data, data signatures is, is still more immature. Um, how many times? Okay. I had two minutes. Okay. Uh, these were my next steps, um, but I think this is microscopic. It's not. Uh, what I wanted to do is I have no, two nodes. How do uh, how do I came between them? And there is currently uh, no way to do it. If uh, I mean, if even if you will have to choose your own encodings, right? So for me, the step number one was at least to have some cosy encoding of the two. We need to send two messages, and there were some work on the, yeah uh, here. Uh, it's been abandoned. I talked with Ori if I can take it. They say yes. Then I discovered like uh, two months ago, uh, somebody already published the Hossi and Cosi encodings again of, uh, of, of Kyber. Um, okay, it's ongoing. Um, I'm gonna talk with these authors and see if I can help, but there is currently no consensus. Uh, in the Hossi working group, they didn't want this. They wanted first to do hybridation and not redo the wheel. Uh, just to say it's a very, uh, okay, uh, hard topic. Uh, and we don't have many IoT uh, guys involved on these ones. And then once we have the encodings, I embed it on, uh, on something like uh, you did with ad hoc. We will need to do the similar thing with uh, MLChem, for instance. The main topics to retain is we will, I probably will need fragmentation uh, unless you can send 800 bytes plus uh, headers. And also when you, uh, Sorry, uh, as we saw, the, all the modes are non-authenticated. So if <laughs> to work in the real day, we'll need authentication mode of MLChem. That's also, as you know, non-trivial, so a lot of work. Uh, I don't want to do crypto, but uh, at least we have to see what's done and, and try to adapt it for our use case. And hybridation public key is being done. It's not actually step three, can be done in parallel to step two, but uh, okay. I'm gonna go faster. So this is last slide, okay? Uh, <laughs> what can we do? Do we want, a quantum resilient IoT, or we say, okay, well, if the quantum uh, computer exists, uh, sorry, IoT is no longer secure. Uh, I think maybe we will need some use cases document or minimum no network requirements. As you saw, I focus on the network part. So the, what's constrained there is the network, not the node. But of course, we also have the, if the node is constrained, uh, one algorithm may be better. Uh, this is simply a, a rhetorical question. Are our post quantum efforts fragmented? Uh, yes, because because it's a hot topic. Everybody's publishing many things. It's a lot of noise. Uh, uh, but uh, and post quantum working group is not enough because they only uh, aggregate things. They are don't don't want to push things. My question is how we align at least within the IoT community. Hannes is nervy. I know uh, somebody's. Uh, um, okay, Hannes is, uh, for what I saw, Hannes is very involved, and he, but okay, uh, Hannes could be a link to see, to keep us updated. We wait and see what the big brothers do, and then we see how we adapt to thing to thing or IoT. It will be a profile for ACE framework, uh, I don't know. And that's it, thank you, I ate uh, everything. Discussion, we don't have time, maybe after. Um, well, John, maybe can answer, ask his question. Uh, more comments, so uh, AS128 is basically the, the definition of category one, and both these um, UK governments said you can use that for decades. I think it's like zero percentage that quantum computers will break AS128 before classical. I think nobody needs to do anything about their um, AS128 
Yeah, I think code base is probably not very important for IoT. Multivariate is probably very important for okay. signatures. And uh, I think depending on your use case, some IoT devices, probably firmware update is probably the most urgent thing if you deploy things in at least yeah. for 30 years. Other things might take the same approach as DNSSEC and the web is also doing planning more and more for, for signatures to take a wait and see mm -hmm. approach and not deploy that now, but later and then maybe never and maybe <laughs> second generation. Yeah, but he, are he, you he, saying that God doesn't exist? No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. For... Can, can I get one sentence in yes. on your slide 16 uh, that you shared? I yes. think it was, yeah. This slide. looks like a great opportunity for a draft. The first, uh... the, this slide you could turn into um, a nice discussion draft. Okay. Um, and in particular, the sorts of things that I would think people would be interested would be sort of the when you know when do you think you're going to meet God, and the the, <laughs> the risks. What I mean by that is what are the you know how how do the, what does the risk look like over time, and that gets us into the big brother when when to follow the big brother discussion, right? Do you do it? Do you start now? Do you start later? And does that vary based on the type of device that you have? If you have a device that's, that you're going to sink into the ground for 40 years, you might have to be making some decisions now. And maybe those are design decisions about how you handle crypto in general. But what is the relationship, say, between that and timing attacks that you might have to worry about as well? So I think it's a, it's a, it would be a pretty big piece of work. It'd be a great research topic. Yeah. Um, for someone who wants to write a paper, I don't know if it's a draft or maybe a, even a submission to an academic conference. Yeah, thank you. Well, inter uh, I'm looking for collaboration, so uh, please join me because I, I'm no cryptographer. I'm, but yeah, thank you, Elliot. Yeah, neither am I. So I'm looking <laughs> for the answers. I want to read the damn thing. <laughs> um, are you going to share the slides? Uh, yes, they are already shared. Yes, yeah, they are ready. All the more in the data tracker yeah. page that I post, posted to the chat. And you have many more info on the appendixes. Okay, I stop the. Thank you, Renzo. I Thank think you. we will keep with the subject for the next decade or four more. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we will. at least. So this was a nice introduction. Thank you. Marco, thank you. Yes, hi, everyone. Uh, this is Marco. This is a good opportunity to present this topic for the first time in slides because uh, it has been just discussion, mostly in design team meetings, and especially with Christian and Joran over the, the last couple of years, I think. So just to set the ground, uh, we've been looking at uh, good work done, especially in the suit working group uh, of the ITF on the distribution of software and firmware update, uh, starting at a high level with the architecture into the definition of the manifest to distribute uh, metadata and other information on, on software update. That got in turn serialized into CBOR, and uh, more recently there has been also work on uh, distributed, uh, distributing an encrypted uh, software or firmware update, fundamentally protected with symmetric cryptography, but where the keys in question can be in turn distributed through symmetric encryption or as a result of uh, ephemeral static DTM. You have a number of uh, possible violations. But in parallel, uh, in the core working group, there has been a lot of work over the years building uh, on, on the main pillar uh, co-op, a number of uh, relevant extensions about it, especially observe, blockwise, and co-op transport over reliable transport, uh, more recently OSCOR for end-to-end -end, uh, protection of co-op messages, and then a, a cluster of works uh, on group communication, uh, for instance, extending OSCOR for group communication or group OSCOR and enabling a number of uh, advanced features like restoring the cacheability of end-to-end -end protected responses and, and even uh, one-to-many responses over multicast for the case uh, of Observe in particular. So we started to wonder at some point if uh, we could somehow uh, take some of these components, combine them somehow in order to make uh, a more efficient distribution of software update, not necessarily dependent on suit, but at least uh, aligned with that and to be used with that uh, if you want to. And the focus is really on the protection and uh, distribution. 
uh, yeah, this is the uh, baseline to uh, improve if you want. And we can imagine in general uh, an author uploading uh, a manifest and the actual firmware update on a server that acts as distributor. And then you have many devices, but just one here in the picture, and then it's just the same for all of them uh, that have an OSCOR security context shared uh, with the distributor server uh, pairwise. Uh, they first observe, practically subscribe, uh, to say a dedicated resource uh, on the server, out of which uh, through automatic notification, they can learn of the availability uh, of a new um, software update version of the manifest technically, but communicating about that. And after that, the device can enter uh, in a sort of uh, pool mode where it asks for the new actual uh, software update, uh, possibly aided by blockwise to chunk the, the big thing into, uh, into smaller blocks. And the communication between the two is protected uh, end to end with OSCOR. So how can we make that better uh, using group communication in particular? And there's different aspects to focus on, but fundamentally we still have a, a single uh, distributor server that is a member of uh, a same um, group OSCOR uh, security group together with all the devices uh, that you want to uh, update that act as client here too. And for a number of reasons that we'll, we'll better see uh, in the next few slides, we also have a, a proxy deployed in between uh, the clients and the servers. Uh, we'll see that we'll take advantage of the restored uh, cacheability of end-to-end -end protected responses uh, on the proxy uh, to improve performance. Uh, together with another thing, the proxy will fundamentally fetch uh, the firmware update from the distributor server uh, in multiple separate rounds, uh, fetching relatively large inner chunks. And then the proxy will further split into further smaller outer chunks, uh, each inner chunk, uh, and distribute those smaller pieces uh, to the devices to uh, update. But an example will come showing this. This is the, the gist. Uh, okay, these are the design goals, uh, of course, and when security of the uh, distributed uh, software update practically achieved by uh, using group of score. Uh, you can slip tight about uh, key provisioning. You don't really have to invent anything particular here. You can seamlessly use the uh, key provisioning we have defined separately and based, uh, for example, on a group manager that can, you can, for example, instantiate um, as, a, as a version based on, on the ACE framework and, and access control, which is uh, already pretty much defined in a number of documents. Uh, you also want to minimize the interactions with all the actors involved here, uh, starting from uh, the distributor, uh, bothering it and fetching uh, data from it as least as possible. And fundamentally that builds on the proxy and on the cacheability of messages at the proxy. But in a quite similar way, you can also reduce the uh, interactions with the clients to update, uh, again, thanks to the proxy and thanks to the distribution uh, of the data to these clients through one to many responses uh, sent uh, over multicast. Reusing uh, concepts that were defined uh, for different reasons in, in documents focusing more on uh, one to many uh, multicast notifications, but that uh, came up useful here uh, too. And then we have the farther chunking that I mentioned before, trying to go as small as possible with small chunks to send to the uh, possibly constrained link between uh, the devices to update uh, and the proxy. So how would it practically work? Uh, it's about two phases. First about uh, informing of the availability of the new version. And it's not too different than what I showed in the baseline really, only that we, we have a proxy now and capable to cache the responses it gets from uh, the distributor server. So the, the very first device here subscribing on the resource for the availability of, of new uh, manifest and software update will uh, reach uh, the server all the way and get a response through the proxy. Uh, but the forthcoming uh, device instead will just produce a cache hit at the proxy and will quicker retrieve the same information about um, a new firmware update uh, available to fetch. And here the communication is protected end-to-end -end with group of score between uh, the same and single server, but all the devices to update. There is room for further optimizations if you want, if you let the server here specifically use uh, multicast notifications and uh, in that way sending um, a response for the availability of a new software update at once to multiple observing proxies that in turn can at once notify mm -hmm. Uh, multiple cluster of devices uh, behind them. 
phase two is the actual distribution instead. That's where things get more interested. And bottom line, the proxy has to fetch a number of relatively large uh, inner chunks uh, from the server. Uh, so I'll go through the steps of uh, the first round for that. And then it's just repeating the process until the whole firmware update is transferred. But this is kickstarted by uh, a client uh, talking to the proxy uh, and asking for uh, the first block or chunk of index zero from the client point of view. And that first client will indeed trigger the proxy to fetch from the server the first large inner chunk. The proxy caches it and does not uh, provide the data right away to the client. It replies with an error, hold on response, uh, telling the client uh, this transfer, meaning the transfer of this current inner chunk will start in say 60 seconds. Uh, get ready, I'll send it to this multicast destination address with this co-op token, get ready. And a second client uh, can come before the timeout expires. And similarly, the proxy now out of the cache sheet uh, we reply with the same sort of hold on uh, error response with the updated value of the countdown, but of course indicating the same destination address and the same co-op token. More clients can come. Uh, eventually the timeout expires and the proxy starts transferring this current mm -hmm. inner chunk, but further split into smaller outer chunks, each of which is sent uh, over multicast as a response message uh, to all the um, listening clients. And eventually all the outer chunks of the current inner chunk uh, will be transferred, but maybe something went wrong. So the proxy may want to give some room for the clients to individually come back and ask for some outer chunk that they have missed. So far it's a bit of an open point and the proxy has a bit of uh, gambling and call of judgment on deciding exactly what to do, because if only a few blocks were missed, uh, for a few clients only. Well, it can pay off to reply with the missed outer chunk right away uh, to a client coming for that. But if instead we want to be pessimistic, we can say no, many outer chunks were missed for many clients. So let's just reply right away with an old on error response and schedule the retransmission of any outer chunk that was missed by at least one client, so to say. So that's a bit of a gambling to be uh, mm -hmm. evaluated. And eventually the proxy will declare completed the transfer of the current uh, inner chunk and things will be repeated when an next client comes asking for a chunk of index zero from its point of view, the proxy will fetch the next uh, inner chunk from the server and this will be repeated until the whole thing um, is transferred. And once this part was uh, a bit stable, we started to, to look more at the details and we noticed um, the possibility for incremental consistency and integrity checks uh, in the process. So clearly at the very end, uh, devices can verify to have received the, the right thing and completely uh, checking, for example, an original signature put there by the, the author of the software update or the distributor, depending what what you want to do. You have a choice in, in, in suit, for example. Uh, even better than that, uh, the devices have the possibility to verify the integrity uh, of each big inner block uh, or chunk that was transferred by verifying the, the group of score signature that you have uh, for each of those reassembled uh, responses. But that's not good enough. And if you don't have any integrity check at all on the small outer chunks, it's very simple and very cheap for an active adversary to just manipulate some of, your, of those messages or inject a crafted one um, and, and eventually annoy the transferring process uh, and, and you just have to wait for the devices to have received uh, all the small chunks of the current inner chunks to notice something is wrong uh, when failing uh, the verification of the group of score signature. So ironically, the adversary here would be exploiting the efficiency of group communication in, in the interest of making the attack even more uh, efficient and convenient uh, hurting the process for, for many uh, targets at once. And when working on this problem, we found a possible way out, and they will be about having uh, an as cheap uh, checksum computed by the proxy on, on each response conveying an outer uh, chunk and to be transported, for example, in a co-op option. And the checksum can simply be um, a two-byte truncated MAC computed on the response message in question, 
uh, using a MAC key that, skipping some details, can be derived from the uh, group Oscar key material of that uh, Oscar group. And of course, you immediately notice a, a problem. The devices are group members, uh, so no problem with that, but how can the proxy have that MAC key to compute that MAC? And there are different approaches to address that. Uh, the first one is really uh, minimalistic and, of course, with a big con, you just make the proxy a group member as well. Uh, so in that case, just like the other members can compute the MAC key from the main key material. This is not nice if you think of uh, the usual wish to have the proxy non-trusted, and if you make it a group member, well, you have to live with the fact that uh, because of group confidentiality, uh, the proxy can uh, at least have read access to the messages exchanged and that may be undesirable. Mm -hmm. The next best thing would be, okay, the proxy is not a group member, uh, not a full-fledged group member at least, but it can have a sort of special role as a collaborator with the group. And we have a president, uh, precedent for that, uh, thinking of the external signature verifier. So we can set a sort of ad hoc interaction between the group manager and, and this uh, proxy to provide this proxy with some particular key material that allows the proxy and consequently also the group members to derive the MAC key, but nothing more. Uh, good in a sense, but it complicates key provisioning and the interface and the operations of the group manager. Uh, a totally different set of approaches instead is about the server, the distributor, providing the MAC key to use to the proxy uh, for, uh, for processing the outer chunks of the current inner chunk when providing the inner chunk. Uh, to the proxy. And uh, approach three is really about the server giving the proxy the actual MAC key. And this opens for the disadvantage that in that case, you really need also a secure association between the proxy and the server to not expose the key. Unless you have an association of that kind anyway for other reasons, it may be inconvenient to add it just for this. That's why approach four uh, that was suggested by Joran, where uh, in that case, the server will not give the proxy the exact MAC key, but just material to compute it in such a way that you don't need any more, unless you have it anyway, a secure association between uh, the server uh, and the proxy. And for example, the server can give the proxy uh, an ephemeral DFL MAC key of the server together with an encrypted and authenticated object, so a CAM if you want, uh, that is uh, indeed wrapping in a cryptographic way uh, the MAC key uh, using uh, a key derived from a secret, derived from uh, the ephemeral key of the proxy, sorry, of the server and the static key uh, of the proxy. Uh, this is good because you don't need a secure association between the two anymore. Uh, if you want it as the disadvantage that the server has to be pre-configured with or acquired at runtime some additional configuration about the proxy, for example, the public key of the proxy, but it should be something uh, possible to uh, address in a reasonable way. And finally, either if you go for approach three or four, you'd be about putting the MAC key or material to compute the MAC key, whatever, in a co-op option as it was originally imagined. And that option starts be, uh, becoming big, which is not good. Uh, the payload would be preferable uh, in the interest of avoiding fragmentation, but we have a payload already uh, in, in those messages. It, it's an OSCORE ciphertext uh, with a group of score signature. Uh, what we would like to have is something prepended to that OSCORE ciphertext in the same core payload. And we've seen this pattern before uh, in a core document where uh, we define an ad hoc ad hoc option uh, telling, well, your core payload is exactly ad hoc message three uh, followed by an Oscar payload. And there are two fixes along this line that are possible here, uh, a very similar one, which is quick and dirty if you want. Well, another uh, ad hoc uh, co-op option to be used as empty, just as a flag to say, well, your co-op payload is the MAC key or material to compute the MAC key concatenated with the Oscar ciphertext. Uh, or uh, something more reusable, more uh, parameterized, if you want, a co-op option with value and unsigned integer uh, x, telling you your co-op payload is some binary blob with semantics x that has to be defined in some document, uh, followed by the uh, OSCORE ciphertext. Uh, so these approaches are a bit uh, open for comparison and better judgment, but if we go uh, all the way down here to the rabbit's hole, uh, this little bit uh, I was mentioning is probably something better to consider uh, in the co-working group for the sake of co-op extensibility, actually.
And that's all I have, just a summary on the problem at hand, the process and the rationale that we consider for addressing it, including more recently the, the checksum problem for discouraging uh, cheap denial service attacks and the distribution of that additional uh, key material to, uh, to make it happen. There is no document about that yet, and my plan would be to start writing this down as an experimental draft to propose to the research group. Uh, I would really appreciate at least one quarter. Uh, Christian comes to mind, definitely considering all the contribution we made to the discussion and the initial design of this. And that's all I have. I hope I'm in time. Thank you. Exactly used up your 17 minutes. So yeah. we have no time for questions, but maybe a very short one. We're eagerly looking forward to this draft. Uh, maybe oh. we will have lots more questions then. I guess so. And thanks, Carter, for the input already today on things to consider for comparison or put in perspective at least, uh, like norm and flute, if I remember correctly. Yeah, we'll do. Yeah, I have this history in reliable multicast and that occasionally comes through, so sorry about that. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so we are on the last talk today then. Richard? So let me share my screen here. Yes, please. One moment. <laughs> okay, looks like I have to share the entire screen. Maybe I'll go to the higher lower. Right. I hope you can see my screen well now. Uh, yes. So today I want to present this work, which is actually a draft in the T2TRE uh, research group, uh, up to version two now, about using onion routing with co op. And um, the authors are Christian Amsis, Marco Tiloka, and me, Rika Höglund. I also want to acknowledge and thank Simon Bouillet, who is present today for his ongoing work on making a formal model of this in the Hammer Improver tool. Um, so yes, one moment. So, an overview. So what this is about, well, as you know, Coop was designed to function both with direct con uh, connections and also function via proxies. And uh, that's built in and, and uh, comes with co-op. Uh, what this document does is define how to establish chains of co-op proxies, aka circuits, and some supplemental services for discovery, naming, and message forwarding logic. And fundamentally, what we're trying to do is enable operation of clients and hidden services similar to for meaning that the client can hide its network identity and the server can if it's functioning as a hidden service. And we have a number of building blocks that we build on to uh, create the solution. And the main ones are the resource directory for registration and discovery of hidden services and uh, proxies, OS Core for the actual securing of the co-op messages, ad hoc for establishing OS Core security context between the client server and the proxies and also between client and proxy and the server and the proxy. And finally, we have this draft uh, OSCOR capable proxies that is detailing how you use OSCOR at proxies and how you do the nested OSCOR protection. So of course, the nested protection here is a key aspect to be able to create these circuits. Um, and that allows you to do secure tunneling because you can nest the the forwarding instructions into the actual OSCOR layers as you protect. So each proxy can get its own uh, forwarding instruction to understand what to do. And that's what enabled this circuit functionality. Uh, continuing the overview, again, it's about enabling Tor-like functionality for co-op. And what's common and is the case always is that anytime you use OS Core, that OSCOR association has been established using ad hoc. So there's no pre-configured OSCOR associations around. It's always starting from ad hoc. 
And the client uses OS Core end to end with a hidden service, and also with each individual proxy in the client side circuit with the hidden service. And likewise, the server uses OS Core end to end with the client and with each of the proxies in the server side circuit. We also have a resource directory, which is used for the hidden services and proxies to advertise themselves as available. And it also allows clients to discover a hidden service and the actual proxy to use to connect to that hidden service. So the, the client needs like an entry point. It knows the hidden service address, but then it needs to be able to discover, okay, which proxy do I practically use to, to reach this hidden service? Um, yeah, and the proxies themselves, yeah, they relay messages to the server and clients and also to other proxies. And we also enable that the, uh, the proxies themselves can be used by the client and hidden service to retrieve the list of available proxies. So that's a good entry point for discovering additional proxies in the system if you already know one proxy. And to go into a bit more detail on the proxy discovery, uh, the rationale here is that, well, as a client and server, you need to discover the list of eligible proxies and existing proxies in the system, along with possible metadata, such as if the proxy wishes to function as an exit node, or uh, possibly also like which country is this proxy located in or, or other types of metadata. So there is a list of all registered proxies. And of course, this list needs to be updated uh, regularly. And we also want this list to be signed by independent entities that are like the roots of trust in the system. Uh, this list can be quite large if you have a lot of proxies, so it should be split into smaller pieces. And our idea here is to provision each device with a fragment of the list at bootstrap. And then as long as you have one proxy in the list that you can reach, you can use that proxy as an entry point to retrieve the latest list maybe not the entire list, but at least one fragment or a set of fragments. Um, and um, some example on what this list can contain is the proxy's cryptographic identity, some affiliation information like operator and location, and optionally a public IP address if this proxy wants to be available as a first hop in the chain. And yeah, just to go into like two examples of topologies. So the top one is basic one without a hidden service. So you have a client, you have a client side circuit, and then the last proxy in that circuit is the one that will be connecting to the server. And on the bottom, you have a bit more complicated setup where you actually have the server acting as a hidden service. And in this case, you have a client side circuit, which is composed of P1, P3, P6, and P7. And you have a server side circuit, which is P5, P2, P4, and P7. And of course, P7 here, it functions as like the connection point here between the circuits. And to uh, borrow some terminology here from Tor, it acts as an introduction point. So basically, the client will know that, okay, to reach this hidden service, it looks it up in the resource directory, and it will discover that, yes, this hidden service will be available through proxy P7. And yeah, to continue on, so this, this slide is about in the case when you are not using uh, hidden service functionalities, so you basically have a only a client side circuit. And what does the client do? Well, it picks again, it discovers the list of proxies, uh, starting from an existing proxy that is aware of, and then it picks uh, three proxies uh, to hide its position from the server. And then you do this nested OSCore protecting protection, such that each proxy PX has its forwarding instructions protected with the OSCore context for PX. And in this way, you, we can nest these forwarding instructions so that each proxy will remove one OSCore layer, and then it, we can, um, it, it can see the forwarding instructions uh, relevant for it. And yeah, so each POP request can contain one forwarding instruction per OSCore layer, and this practically results in uh, source routing. So the, the um, the client determines the route through the system. And um, to just go on a high level, how do you establish this circuit? Well, again, it's based on ad hoc, so you end up 
first running Edoc with the first proxy in the chain. Uh, next, you run Edoc with the second proxy, of course, using the first proxy as a proxy. And you kind of, this is like an iterative process. And eventually, you have established Edoc um, and Oscar associations with all these um, entities here listed at the bottom. So basically, the client has an Oscar association with the server. Uh, with proxy one, with proxy two, with proxy, proxy three, and also with the, um, and, and also the, sort of the proxies themselves have Oscar associations with each other. Because as you can see here in the figure, there's also Oscar between the individual proxies. And now in the case that you actually use a hidden service, um, <clears throat> so we determined like we, we needed like a naming convention for the address of a hidden service. And basically the address is based and built from the public authentication credential of that hidden service. And the way it's built is based on the T2TRD, RD link and the code transport indication drafts. And to give a concrete example there at the bottom, you can have something like co-op uh, slash slash tlsa.x.upgrade.arpa an X here would be the base 32 URL encoding yeah. of the representation of a CBOR map, and the CBOR map com conveys the public authentication credential of the hidden service, either by value or by reference. And in this way, the actual, yeah, so, so the, the actual credential of the hidden service is included in its address, which, so if you discover the address and find out the address, you already have the credential. And so the point of the hidden service is, of course, that the server wants to hide its position. And essentially, the server will choose this introduction point that was P7 in the previous slides. And then it will, in the same way as the client does, iteratively run ad hoc with the proxies um, in the server side circuit, terminating at that introduction point. And then it will instruct the introduction point to register the server as an available hidden service at the resource directory. And uh, what does a client do? Well, through one of the proxies that it has established connection with, it looks up the hidden service by name. Of course, you have to discover the name and similar to Tor, there, there can be uh, various ways to, to do this discovery. Um, and then you create this uh, client side association with the introduction point. And when you have done that, now you're actually in the position as a client because the server side circuit is set up, the client side circuit is set up. So at this point, the circuits can be connected and thus the client can actually establish an end-to-end -end association all the way to the hidden service. And again, it knows the credentials for the hidden service already based on the address of it. And uh, yeah, so a as a little uh, optimization or alternative way this can function is that in the scenario I described previously, you have this introduction point and that's also what you then use to transmit data and requests from the client to the server. However, you could do this uh, differently if you wish to in the sense that uh, instead of using this introduction point to exchange application layer data, you actually use it to, to indicate to the client that, okay, we have, a, we have this initial circuit now. Uh, however, for the actual data circuit, I want you to switch and use yet another proxy. Uh, so this is similar to the concept in Tor where they have the introduction point and then a rendezvous node. Um, so you actually switch to a different circuit for actual um, data traffic. And yeah, so how do you actually set up the and connect this full uh, circuit for the hidden service, meaning both the client side circuit and server side circuit? Um, so first of all, we're defining two new co-op options. One is enable reverse proxy, which is an empty option. And that basically instructs the receiver to consider that uh, when the request you're proxying for me results in role reversal, meaning role reversal in the sense of switching from client to server roles, 
then please act as a reverse proxy for me. And we also have this reverse URI host option, which is a text string indicating a host. Um, that means that your incoming reverse requests that relate to this request must have URI host host. So basically, the, the client circuit here, the proxies there act as forward proxies, but the P2, P7, and P5, they will act as reverse proxies for the client. And that's why we need a way to for them to associate host names with this circuit so they can actually uh, forward the, the communication from the client. After it reaches P4, there needs to be a way for these proxies to understand that, okay, this communication, now I'm acting as reverse proxy, this communication should end up at server one eventually, because we don't want them to act as for a proxies and that would basically necessitate the client uh, having the actual <clears throat> true address of the server and then you lose the point of dissolution. Um, but if you assume, again, not having these split roles, but P4 will be functioning as an introduction point, then the server, again, establishes a server-side circuit terminating at P4, and you install these reverse forwarding rules on the proxies using these co-op options. P4 will register itself as an introduction point for the server at the resource directory, the client looks for the server, discovers P4 as introduction point, establishes a client-side circuit terminating at P4, and finally, client can run ad hoc with the server through this now connected double circuit. And to go into a bit more detail on the, the, because fundamentally you need to build a kind of routing table on the proxies, so they are instructed and understand how to forward and how to protect a request after it reaches the introduction point and it's going towards the server. And the this routing table can contain a number of elements and we have defined these ones, uh, which is the requested host that you use as a lookup key basically to find the entry in the table. We have the next stop address indicating where to forward this incoming request. We have the next stop virtual host where you actually specify which URI host option to put in this outgoing request when forwarding it. And that ties back to the, that you should use the correct URI host as has been previously configured with these options such that the next proxy in the chain understands that, oh, you're using this URI host. Then I know as a reverse proxy, which next proxy to forward it to. And then you also have information about the actual OSCOR contexts to protect this request with. And both the innermost protection and then the outermost protection, uh, if any, so up to two layers here. And what are the logic, what are the steps uh, taken by a proxy when forwarding a request towards a hidden service? You remove the URI host option. Um, and then yeah, we have this um, logic that if the CTX0 field is not empty, you can move to step three. And I think for, for uh, the sake of speed, I will consider that case. Uh, if that is the case, you will protect the request with CTX1. And if the field next to virtual host is not empty, well, then you should add a URI host option with the value that you looked up in the table and then protect the request with CTX0. And finally, now you're ready to send the request to the address specified in the next top address. And the whole point is that this routing table can be filled by usage of these previously mentioned options. And then when it's about forwarding, it's really a, a basic process. You're just looking up in that table and you know immediately as a proxy what to do and how to, to process the request um, and what to put in your outgoing request. Oh, so next steps, uh, continue updating the draft. We have a lot of notes on multiple points, including comparison with Tor, a straw man of a step-by-step -step circuit establishment, like really detailed message by message. Um, we also have defined uh, in more detail this circuit establishment when the rendezvous node is a different proxy than, than the introduction node. Uh, a number of open issues are tracked at the GitHub repository or GitLab repository for this draft. And as always, any feedback and questions are very welcome. So thank you. Thank you. So we have minus one minute for a question. Question. Um, 
can you can you give us an example for your use case where tor like capabilities are needed in the iot setup yeah it would really be in any similar scenario where you would like to use tor so you would like to yeah hide the network identity of the client or the server and uh, so anywhere we would in any scenario where you would like to use tor you could also use this um and I think like, you know, you could have some, some examples, you know, possibly like um, health monitor devices or some implementations in smart homes, uh, some kind of decentralized applications, um, possibly even software updates. If you're really concerned about hiding the source uh, of the update to not be target for denial of service attacks or otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in a general case, I would say anywhere would you, where you would like to use Tor and as IoT devices become, um, well, as the number of IoT devices keep growing, you may um, have more scenarios where you would like to have something like Tor, but based on an IoT protocol stack. Okay, so I don't know for what the people are using Tor, so that's why I ask. Um, I think one one important use case can also be um, like cargo tracking, because otherwise, um, without something like this, um, every every um, Every piece of cargo that phones home about its location will reveal whom it whom it is being tracked for. With 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 this, it can it can connect to the network without revealing whom it. Um, to whom so it's, it is. A privacy yes, it's a privacy. Yes, it's preserving technology. Okay. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So exactly hiding your network identity, keeping your privacy as a client or also as a server that wishes to be uh, available, but not reveal your network identity, your your IP address, practically. Yeah. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow and over dinner. <laughs> yeah. So um, we right. will be thrown out of the building at some point. Um, so I'm, I'm sorry for, for cutting this off. Uh, we have one more thing we need to discuss, which is uh, how do we use our breakout slot tomorrow, which is from 9 to 11. So we currently have one presentation scheduled. Can you explain what that is about? I'm, not exactly familiar with that project. Yes, I've learned one. Oh, okay, good. So we will have a mystery um, presentation. Yeah. <laughs> Can you say one sentence about that? Right. So, so I mean, this is uh, this is actually a request from uh, of, on a topic which is not necessarily T two T R G. Um, that uh, there are some people from Asabloy who has been working on on ad hoc implementations and want to look at how to make uh, ad hoc more exposed uh, and also looking at servers, interoperability servers for ad hoc. Uh, and so that's a, that's a proposal for using one of the hours that it actually belongs to T2TRG. So this is a formal petition for for. Snatching one of those hours from you, um, or if you or if you like, please join the meeting. I think it's going to be interesting. Um, but but uh, please let me know what which time that that is available for, right. so I can. So, yeah. So I was going to to ask: uh, Are there any other items we want to pick up for for a breakout? meeting tomorrow. So we had several presentations uh, uh, in the interim meeting. We also had some interesting side meetings during uh, the day. And um, I was wondering whether anybody was going to champion uh, doing a slot about uh, one of the subjects uh, tomorrow morning. Um, I can give a short update on what we did on the topic of machine to machine. Uh, Great. machine to machine work. Yeah. So how much time do you need for that? 10, 15 minutes. Okay. Anything else? One quick question. Uh, KTPP is working on sort of AI standardization in the, you know, the 560 context. Are there any efforts within the IOD community on the AI standardization dispatch? There are various activities coordinating with uh, no. the I'm not 
aware of anything that is specifically focused on IoT. Um, but um, I think it would be good to, to uh, um, enhance the, that uh, collaboration. Uh, I'm just not sure that this would be a good subject for everyone. Yeah. So um, I think, um, given we want to use the second half of the meeting for the Asad Neu thing from 10 to 11. Okay. Yeah, pardon me? Okay. 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 That was an okay. You're slightly <laughs> clipping. That, that's why it's hard to understand it. Um, and um, maybe we can just meet a little bit earlier than that, like uh, um, nine forty or something, uh, to have a discussion on the machine to machine thing. So we start tomorrow at, at, with a breakout at nine forty. To machine to yeah. machine here in this room, yeah. and we, we will use the. Uh, in the WebEx tomorrow, not the interim Web Web WebEx, because uh, the breakouts tomorrow are not formally part of the interim. And so those who join today on the IDF WebEx will need to use the uh, in the WebEx, uh, which was sent around to most local people. But if you don't have it, just send the ticket and chairs. Okay. So anything else we need to do today? Yeah, just for my understanding. So 10 to 11, we can talk about uh, ad hoc.me and these things. Is that is that correct? Yes. Perfect. Thank Paris. you very much. Paris time. But you are also Paris time, so. Yeah, yeah. I am. But Esther Abloy is not. Um, yes, they are Central European, so that should be. <laughs> okay, for once. <laughs> <Should, laughs> No, it should be the same time zones, I think. Yeah. They are based in Krakow, so that's uh, that's the same I, as Ber I, Berlin. Oh, it's, it's actually uh, central European time as well. Okay, so uh, thank you all for for uh, staying long for for the day. I mean, it's uh, seven seven p.m. here in the local uh, time zone. And uh, I hope you, those of you who were new to the DPTRT, have taken notes of, of uh, the research group mailing list, and maybe we'll, we'll join the mailing list. It's not exactly overwhelming. 